for leading a squad, the way that you then went through your career and really helped other women, and I was one of them at 17 years old. Have you ever considered, like, I know you see your, your mother in so much of yourself, but like, you have mothered so many girls and women in this business, in your business as, a, as an entertainment reporter, as a sports reporter, you've paved the way for the, all the cheerleaders. I, I don't know how to start this without crying. Oh my God. <laughs> So I'm just gonna let it roll. It's gonna cry, you know, it's gonna happen. Um, thank you, first of all, for being here busy. Busy and I uh, go back decades. Um, what she said about mothering other women is something I haven't really thought about, which is why it impacted me so, so hard. So when you read the book, you'll see that I lost my mother when I was eight. And so I've spent my entire career you know, looking for bonding experiences with other women, which I talk about, which is why I got into cheerleading and acting and modeling in the hopes of finding sisterhood and, and also, you know, finding maternal connections with women as a director of cheerleaders. So um, the entire book is kind of, you know, from the outside, it's like, oh, it's a book about sports casting or it's a book about being an investigative reporter, but really it's not. It's a book about, um, how women relate to each other, how women support each other, how some women don't support each other, mm -hmm. um, but how we really hopefully at the very end, we find this human connection with each other through empathy. And, you know, always bringing it back to, you know, being an investigative reporter when people say you're brave, you're chasing these bad guys, I would say that I'm only able to do that because of empathy, not audacity. I don't chase people out of some swagger of wanting to perform for a camera. There's always an element of somebody did me the incredible honor of sitting down with me and telling me how they were marginalized, how they were hurt, how they lost their life savings or lost a loved one. And then armed with that information, that is why I go and chase bad guys. You know, it's to find accountability for what happened to that person. So my bravery comes from empathy. And I think that women, a lot, a lot of times in journalism, they say to all reporters, don't be biased, don't be emotional, don't get emotionally connected to your subject, to the person you're standing across from or sitting across from. I say bullshit. <laughs> Honestly, we need more empathy in journalism in the world with each other. Um, so when I first well, I, well, I totally agree with you. And Lisa tells this truly amazing story about Dennis Rodman when he was going to maybe sign with the Lakers and maybe not. And he was in, you know, you guys, we've watched all the documentaries. Um, and he calls this press conference at Planet Hollywood. And at that moment in your career, you were working two very grueling, intense jobs, but they were both your dream jobs and you felt like you had to pursue both. One was as a sports reporter for the local affiliate in Los Angeles, Fox, for the, that did the Lakers and all the sports, and the other one was, you know, on a soap opera, an Aaron Spelling soap opera playing Francesca. The evil Francesca. The evil Francesca. Um, and, he was wasting everyone's time because he wasn't planning on announcing that he had signed yet. And Lisa fucking had it. And you <laughs> stood up and called him out and burst into tears. He burst into tears. Not you. Not, not me. I burst into tears later. Right. <laughs> but you know, that the point of that story really was to illustrate how marginalized you know, women can be in sports, um, how all of us, and, and journalists in general, you know, I think there's an enormous amount of disrespect, you know, from going back from a few years ago when somebody started saying that the press is your enemy and don't believe the news and fake news, et cetera. So, you know, I think that story was telling a couple of stories at the same time. I agree. Right. Many, because I mean, there's also just, 
you walking into the place and all and and seeing all of the national sports reporter men and their crews and the kinds of looks that you received and the kinds of comments that you overheard and what you had to just endure and shut your brain off and probably disassociate to be honest true and 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 what a shame that you can't just walk in to a room and be in full and complete ownership of who you are, what you look like, what you bring to the table, you know, your accent, your weight, your gender, who you love, like all those things. Why can't we just be that and own that and then tell a story as a, sto a sports reporter or a journalist through your eyes, given your experience, rather than having you judge simply by what you look like. And believe me, when you're on television, they want you to look good. I joked that when I was on Monday Night Football, yes, I was you know, sitting at the makeup table and getting my hair and makeup done, but so was Al Michaels and so was John Madden. It's a visual medium. So they want you to look as good as possible. And women in sports are held to that standard where you have to look great, but you better know your sports as well. So yeah, when I walked into that press conference in a Barbie pink suit, that I stole from the set of Sunset Beach. Because <laughs> I was a struggling <laughs> actor. Um, you know, nobody took me seriously until I asked the, fir the first tough question. And after that, they took me pretty seriously. At least and for a while, I, until 2003. But I also love that in even the retelling of that story, you take ownership of like, I didn't know what Dennis Rodman was going through. Like in retrospect, I have empathy for the man and I feel sad for all of the systems that like propped him up and enabled his bad behavior, you know? And they were, the sports reporters were one of them, but at the same time, bless you for saying, because no one else would do it. And I was curious if in this current climate you know, you do investigative journalism, which is its own beast, but in this political climate that we are currently in, I feel like there's so much both sidesing that the truth, the actual truth has been lost. And I was curious if you have any thoughts or feelings or ideas on how we get out of it. How long do we have? <laughs> there are so many thoughts on this. So it goes back to empathy again because there is a lack of empathy towards others in general. And when you have a lack of empathy, when you can't put yourself in somebody else's shoes and have a human connection with other people that don't have your experience or don't live in your city or don't live in your state, then that really breeds contempt and distrust. And I think when we you know, go so far on either side, you know, very far left, very far right. <clears throat> I do understand that there is this sense that you need to meet in the middle, but more importantly, before you can even do that, you have to have a sense of understanding about what somebody else is going through. Because in my book, I went through a lot of trauma. You know, I lost my mom at eight years old. Um, I faced a lot of misogyny in the entertainment business and certainly in, in sports. Um, I had a miscarriage on the sideline, which has now been widely reported because of People Magazine last week. And then finally having suicidal ideations the year after I was fired. All of that trauma and all of those, uh, those obstacles um, led me to a greater understanding of other people who have had trauma and have faced obstacles. And so I use that in the kind of journalism I do. When I chase the bad guys, I'm doing it in service of somebody else that I have empathy for. And this is just in my business. This is just as a journalist. In general, I think if everybody could have that sense of empathy, if only 10% of us began to become more empathetic, that would make a tremendous difference in this real toxic culture of politics. Can I tell you, my one of my friends from high school, we were just talking on the phone the other day, and she had ordered, apparently in Ireland, okay, first of all, she listens to Celine, Killian Murphy, Cillian Murphy is like his radio show. Guys, I don't know. But apparently in Ireland, they have now started a curriculum in schools to teach empathy. And it's having like really profound um, effect on all of these young people and also their parents because obviously it's like trickling up. 
And the idea, somebody came up with this idea that you can't teach empathy. And as a parent, I am here to tell you you can. Because we have two very different children, and one of them is very naturally has always been the kid that's like, why is that person hurt? I'm concerned about that person. And we have another kid that's like, that person should get up. What's wrong with them? You know, like, not, like, and we have, we really can cultivate it in people. And I think that our culture is just not, I don't know, if it's the internet or like the disconnect of being apart. We lost our third places. I don't know, you know? Plus there's like, there's this, there's this sense that if you're empathetic, you're not tough. You know, that you're a wussy, that you're, you know, a couple of other words I won't say because we're on Instagram Live. But there is this, this um, perspective that if you are kind, if you're empathetic, if you have compassion for people, that somehow you're not a strong person. You're not a brave person. You're weak. Um, I was just called uh, weak in, on somebody's podcast because of the um, abuse I endured on Monday Night Football and how that affected me. And you know, somebody else said, well, you know, she's just weak. She should, she should have been more tough. And you know, we live in a culture where the people actually think that instead of going, what happened to you? I'm sorry that you had a miscarriage on the sidelines of Monday Night Football for the answer to be, you weren't tough enough is kind of a microcosm. Like this is what's happening in our country that people can't look at somebody else's life and, and relate to it at all. And instead they judge it. Right, and they say you're so lucky because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. You know? Right. And I also just think that was obviously a man who said that. Mm -hmm. It was a woman. Ugh, gross. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Here's what I'm gonna say. Like, it, that is, it is shocking to me, but whatever, we don't need to get into that. What I do want to talk about instead is how you have supported so many women, and I'm just going to tell my story really fast. Please tell okay. I, I didn't know if I wanted to jump into it or you were, but I want you to. Okay. So Lisa has done so many, many things and had many jobs and paths. And it feels like, even though you were like this shy kid, who, by the way, I totally didn't buy it when I was reading the book. I was, because I've never seen pictures of you from high school when you were, your nickname was Q-tip because of the fuzzy hair and you were tall and skinny and gangly. Um, and I was like, she's just one of these beautiful women. Because when I met Lisa, she was, Lisa, she was gorgeous. She was a Barbie doll when I met her. She was gorgeous. And um, and then I saw the picture is in the book. And so there, proof. there is proof <laughs> is that you came with receipts on the day. Yeah, the school picture is not cute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, you all, I, I, I don't know if the gravitation towards performing was because of the team element and looking for friendship and connection. And sisterhood. And sisterhood. Is that what it was? Because then, I mean, to pursue, you've really pursued like a life. Oh, it's all about connection, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And for me, everything you've done has been about connection. Everything has been. Mm -hmm. And specifically female connection. Right. And if I have, you know, awesome connections with men, which I have had great friendships and, and mm -hmm. a great marriage that is now because of my ex husband, we still have an awesome connection. So I feel like my life has definitely been about bonding and finding connections, probably because I didn't have a mom. Um, so that's why women so specifically are important to me. So, and I don't have children. So because I don't have a mother and I don't have children, the relationships I have today are specifically important to me. I'm not gonna have a legacy of, of children or grandchildren and I don't have a mom. So it's all about relationships today. Mm. And that's really something that I think about every day. Well, I have to say, so when I was 17 years old, I also had had a fair amount of trauma by 17 which you can read about in my book, <laughs> New York Times bestseller. <laughs> this will only hurt a little. Um, and you can also read this story, but I'll just tell it to you. Um, I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to perform. I wanted to connect with people. I was really good at it. And I, towards my the end of high school, I kept begging my parents to let me go to LA and be a star. And they were like, that's insane, no. Um, but my mom you did. You were in Arizona at the time. In Arizona. We, I was in high school in Arizona. Yeah. 
Um, I auditioned. I had an, I got an agent. I put that in air quotes because it was in Arizona and I don't think she was actually an agent. Um, <laughs> but she would get some casting notices for local things. And one thing that she sent me out for was this thing called the Mattel Toy Fair. It was actually called the Mattel Pre-Toy Fair because it was in Arizona. The big toy fair was held here in New York City. And um, they were looking for people to play live versions of the toys, the dolls, the Barbies. And I went in and auditioned. Now I have to say, you do a great job of explaining it. Um, you get pages and pages and pages and pages of a script, copy, copy that you have to have completely memorized that include facts and figures and sales projections and why this particular Barbie is going to outsell last year's model of the same Barbie and why we're projecting. And you have to say it seamlessly in character as a Barbie. Yes, you are actually dressed like the live as version a Barbie. of the doll. And they would build these incredible sets of your, it was like, it was like living in a Barbie dream house. It was insane. Yes. Every room you went to, there was like the rocker Barbie room. Do you remember, you were so many Barbies because you were a real, you looked like Teresa, right? <laughs> Teresa was the Latina Barbie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was Teresa doll. I was cool teen skipper. And also um, I was the clueless doll from the clueless TV show. So I was those two dolls. Yes. But I met Lisa and you know, I guess you could write like the move, like the bad movie version of it, which would be all the Barbie girls being snippy and rude to each other behind the scenes. <laughs> mean girl Barbie. Yeah, but you were, you were by far like the queen of the Barbies because you, they would fly you in from LA and you worked with them a lot outside of just the toy fairs and they loved you. And you really set the tone of just like sisterhood and kind and like taking care of each other. And I felt immediately like, I don't know, like I, like I could, you were just safe, but you were just such a safe friend. You weren't, there was nothing. And I didn't question it either. Cause I'm like sort of an open person like that as well. And when I, Lisa and I worked together as Barbie dolls at the New York toy fair, the pre toy fair, two years, I think it was two years. Two years. And I moved to Los Angeles for college and Lisa had already offered to my mother, like, if you guys want to come out ever, come stay with me. But I got into college in LA and I moved there and Lisa said to me, well, give me a call. I'll do whatever I can to help you. And she took me to lunch at the Rose Cafe in Venice <laughs> and it was so fancy. And I was like, a little kid, you know, I was 18. And you talked to me about the business and you told me to be careful. And if anyone ever asks you to go to an audition in a hotel, don't do it. And, um, and my, which happened, which happened, happened to you, you know, and, and, you know, Steven Seagal, I mean, these stories happen to women. And when I told her about this years ago, we didn't know this was actually happening to women in real time. But it was happening to women. But you were so smart and you knew, you know, and you were just so giving. And then at the end of the conversation, she said, no one had cell phones, by the way. You guys, this is 1997. <laughs> she says, let me write down my manager's phone number. You should call her. Her name's Lorraine. You should call her. You know, maybe she'll take you on. She's wonderful. I've already told her about you. And Lorraine ended up being my manager, getting me my agent. I was on Freaks and Geeks less than a year later. And I mean, yeah, it's a success story yes. for sure. Yes. But I have to say, like, when I think about all of the different versions my life could have had, were it not for you and your kindness at the toy fairs and really being a person who connects and is like, I got you. Like, come, just come sit next to me. Like, I got you, you know? I owe so much to you, Lisa. I always have. And I just, reading your book was 
not telling me anything I didn't know. You are so brave, but the best part is that it so comes from like your heart, which is your mother's heart, which is like, stand up for others, make sure people are safe, which is what you did to me when I was 18, 17, and 18, and 19, and I just adore you so much. And Lorraine, our sweet Lorraine. And so my manager who took one look at Busy and was like, oh, star, and signed her immediately. Um, you know, Lorraine is in and out of my book a lot because I had some crazy well, life Lorraine choices. Well, Lorraine goes with you to the yeah. Steven Seagal, which yes. Steven Seagal was not expecting when he entered the door in his robe. Yes. <laughs> to see little Lorraine, he's like, oh, darling, don't worry about it, I'm here. Yeah. I'm here too, just go about it. Oh my God, you got it, you have her voice. I know. So Lorraine, obviously from England, um, signed Busy immediately. And to back up really quickly, why did I want to uh, suggest, because typically when people say they want to be actresses and come to LA, the first thing I would say was, no, you don't. No, you don't. That's a very tough path. It's a very, it's a tough business. It's tough on women. It's tough on young women. It's tough on beautiful blonde young women. Um, the reason why I encouraged her is because she was so special. At 17 years old, she had this vitality and this, um, obviously she was hilarious, but, all, but it's such a rare combination to be so beautiful, young, funny, smart, and just, she had empathy. Like you could just, she connected with people, she was wise beyond her years, definitely. And so I, for once, encouraged somebody, which I never do, I <laughs> never do. And so when she met Lorraine, Lorraine told me, oh, I'm not busy, she's gonna be a huge star. And I said, yeah, I told you. And um, throughout my book, I talk about Lorraine being there for some really difficult uh, parts of my life. And that, this is why it's really important to have women, um, you know, really supporting other women as managers and, and um, mentors in the business, because she was one for me. But she protected me through a lot. And um, she unfortunately passed away uh, a few years ago from cancer. She fought it for a long time, and she just left a great legacy. But she she was very meaningful to me, and she's she's in the book throughout. But um, yeah, so busy is somebody. So I, of course, you know, she gets signed. I see her star rise. I see her become this superstar, and and doing far beyond. Just she's not an actress. She's a creator. She's a writer. She's a producer. She's done so many things that for our paths to cross again now after so many years. It's just been so touching to me, and I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you too, <laughs> and um, and I really think that that connection piece, like as it just as I, I was talking about you and your career and looking at the things that you've done, from you know even best day in sports show. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit because I think it's I think that Tom Arnold reaching out to you in the last few years is very interesting. It is, people evolve. Before before the book came out. Yeah, before. You didn't have to, you know what I mean? Oh, did I turn it off? Sorry, oh wait. You guys, I'm loud. Oh no, I got it, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so tell me about that, because Bestian wasn't the total disaster that Monday Night Football was for you, but it wasn't great. It was, it was I will say this, there were parts of, of doing that job that were really because important and I learned a lot. Yeah. But there were parts of it that were so incredibly inappropriate, so wrong. Um, very so, of the time. Of the time, very much of the time. I mean, this was over 20 years ago. And the show was on Fox Sportsnet. It was called Best Damn Sports Show, period. Uh, David Hill, the president of the, that network, had developed it. And it was a cross between sports and entertainment. So it was these ex-athletes and Tom Arnold together every day, live tele in front of a studio audience, two hours live every single day. And, and they had like live uh, superstar athletes and also actors. You know, you'd get you'd have, you know, Ben Affleck and Shaquille O'Neal and you know, some some comedians. So this this show is a really popular show at the time, but it was very body. And I was the the token girl. I was the sports chick on the show. But the thing that I know that people who, well maybe, maybe people don't, because maybe people are fans from, you know, Inside Edition and aren't, don't know that you are like actually a true expert in sports. Like just from, you're, you love it. I'm a huge sports fan. <laughs> <laughs> and you 
you grew up nine. bonding with your dad and your brother. Correct. I knew this about you before. Yes. When we were when we met, and I was like, yeah, it's not for me, but good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what those are. <laughs> so Tom Arnold was on this um, panel. So he was our our comic, and you guys know who Tom Arnold is, right? Mm -hmm. He's of course. hilarious. Um, and he's a big sports person as well. He loves sports, and so he was kind of the um, the funny fat at the time. Fat, he's not anymore. Um, but he was kind of that character, you know, with a bowling shirt on and smoking a cigar and you know cracking lies about women, etc. And so uh, he and I weren't necessarily close. He was not unkind to me, but we were very different. Our roles were very different on the show. And um, as you'll read, when you go through it, there were some very dark moments for me on that show. I mean, I, my heart just broke. I keep turning it off, okay. My heart just broke reading about that, the roast. The roast, yeah. And I know it, I knew it so well too, just from being a woman in entertainment in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, and what year was that, 2000? That would have been, um, 2001, 2002. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And then, lo and behold, so I, you know, I have a, a bad ending with that show. I leave. I go to HR. Um, you'll read about all the details. Then I, I get picked up by Monday Night Football the next year. And then that debacle happens. And then I want to kill myself the next year. And it took me several years to rebuild my life, my career, find my purpose. But during this time, Tom became sober. Tom had a couple of marriages. He had children, which really changed him. And he started to look at life very differently. And he had an epiphany about what his purpose was as well. So later in the book, you're gonna see that he and I actually became friends again, and like real friends. And he has even become a feminist and has tossed me stories that I investigated that made a difference that led to some policy changes at Liberty University about their sexual abuse and sexual abuse reporting policy. Mm -hmm. And that was because of Tom Arnold. It's incredible. And I and I do think, I wanted to ask you, you know, you call them bad guys and you chase the bad guys, and you, and, but you are an incredibly empathetic person. Do you believe in second chances? Do you believe that everyone, I mean, do you believe that everyone is deserving of empathy? Everybody. I believe in third and fourth and fifth chances. Like everybody is deserving of it. And even though guys that you chase down, down yes. you believe that they have, they have in them like the, the ability to change. Some of them. I will say that, you know, I, I chased down a man who beat to death Juliet Gertz, who was a toddler in her crib and then went on to get away scot-free for four years before we tracked him down. And during that time, he continued to assault and abuse other people. And so, you know, is he, he's in prison right now. Is he, you know, capable of change? Yes, we are all capable of change. Would I be empathetic towards him? I don't know. Right. And that maybe I need to evolve and change. Maybe that's something I should work on to become more empathetic when it comes to some of those people that I know have, have hurt or killed or sexually assaulted women. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, it's really hard. I don't know either if I could, yeah. to be honest. And again, you know, we are all changing every day, right? We're, we're, we continue to evolve and grow. The book is really a story arc about how I have evolved and how I have grown. Um, and I hope to still grow. I hope this isn't my whole life story. I hope this is the first half story. I want to accomplish a lot more moving forward. I mean, you're going to, and I wanted to ask, what what do you see in the, I mean, because I couldn't, I, I don't know. I just feel like from the Rams cheerleader. Also, I want to talk about the pay inequality with the cheerleaders. What the fuck? <laughs> I didn't know that. Even the Laker girls? Yeah. Like, no money? No money. Yeah, no, especially back then in the 80s. I mean, okay, I got paid $25 a game, just to clarify. Okay, and two lousy tickets that were up in like wait, wait, wait. nosebleed section. But for my also, dad. what you described, like, here's what I would say that most fans, now, I'm not, I mean, I did, we did like the Lakers when we lived. Mark's a huge Lakers fan, my ex husband. See, also, we're good friends. Um, but, like, I 
think that I always assumed as just like a passing fan who didn't really care about sports that they were compensated more than $300 a game or whatever it was. But that also it was like they learned, I don't, I don't really know, like that they learned the routine once and like they, that was it. You know what I mean? I, I didn't know all of the work, but then to hear you describe how you were sent to, um, in to get people to like to buy season tickets, you were sent on all of these different, and you not compensated at all. And you're, that is the, that's the problem. You just nailed it. So if you are an ambassador for a billion dollar team or league, then you should be paid and compensated as an ambassador in that community. We weren't, we were just considered free labor. So they would send it's, us out to sports bars and say, sell season tickets. By the way, I was 19 and in a little short skirt at a sports bar that I wouldn't have to get in. No security, home. no security. And so- And you'd be cut from the team if you were like, oh, I don't feel comfortable doing no, it. Right? Yeah, exactly. You are replaceable. But this gets back to what right. we were talking about before feeling disposable. And you were definitely, because a thousand people tried out, 1,100 or 1,200 people tried out my first year. Seven of us made it as rookies. So if you say no to something, they're like, uh, there's the door. And you know, there's a thousand girls, literally a thousand women would take your place. So um, yeah, that the cheerleading thing is interesting. And I th and the people that I've read it, not been, it came out today, so most people haven't read it yet. But I think that the people that have read it, that has really resonated with them, the cheerleader stories. And I will also say, I'm glad I did it because I now have hundreds of girlfriends that from that world of NFL cheerleading because I did find my sisterhood. So for me, I was able to get you know these friendships that were worth more than money, but I shouldn't have had to choose. I should have been paid too. Well, it's also, I mean, just so you know, we had season tickets to the Lakers and our older daughter literally thought that it was they take turns. And she's like, when do the girls do their thing? Like to her, the show was both. Yeah. It was the, it was the game <laughs> and then okay. the ladies dancing. Like they do both because yeah. they the girls wanted to do their thing, you know, I think a lot of people think that, you know, like the, it should be, I'm just saying it's wild. It is wild. It's, it's so funny. And, and, you know, as I'm looking out, I have some girlfriends here, Damaris, I have Leslie, I have Rhonda, and these girls all have really interesting and incredible backgrounds and experience in being a man in a woman's world. And I know that, that they probably have thoughts about cheerleading and, and, you know, the misogyny that we're talking about. Um, you know, again, nothing, nothing, nothing will ever make me regret being an NFL cheerleader because it really led to me being a sportscaster, which led to me being an entertainment reporter, which led to me being an investigative reporter, which led to me putting a man behind bars from 80 years to life in prison for killing somebody. So everything in your life can lead to something else. And that's another big important part of my book is to understand that all of our paths have a purpose and you can turn pain into power. If you harness what you know you need to do in that time. Now I change tomorrow and your goal might change a month from now. But if you continue on a path of doing what you think is important and what you wanna do, eventually you will find your place. And I'm so glad our paths Came back here to each other because this is a remarkable conversation. I'm just, I, I love Busy Phillips so much. And we all love Busy. I mean, we think we know Busy from all of the, the remarkable work she's done, but to really know her and to see her here. And did you feel, do you feel her? She's amazing. She's so amazing. Um, you're so amazing, Lisa. Um, wait, do we have time? We have time for a few more, yeah? How many? I don't, I'm not watching any clocks or anything. We didn't talk about it. I mean, I would just sit here all night, if I'm being honest, but as a genius. We'll do that another time, too. You well, we need have to get to. together and, like, really dish. Oh, my gosh, we really have to. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, great. We've got plenty of time. Okay, great. Should we uh, stop at 7.30? That'd be still great. Still plenty of time to stop. Yeah, because there's Guys, are we still recording? Yeah, of course we Do you know, uh, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, like, just, like, trying to float around a little bit. Do you have an idea about what you, where you see the next chapter going for your life? I'm so glad you asked that because I do. 
I have a, I, I'm somebody that feels like you should have specific goals. <gasps> Me too! Yay! <laughs> I think the more specific, the, the more it happens. I agree. The clearer you are about yes. where you want to go, 100%. the more clear everybody is around you and that energy is to get there. So my feeling is that I would like this book, first of all, I want people to read the book and get something out of the book. I want Oprah to read it. I want manifesting. I want Oprah. Oprah, please read my book. Because I also, I said to Lisa back there, and I'll just say it here for your benefit. Um, I think that, I know Drew Barrymore had such a very strong reaction to the book and that airs on Monday, which is fantastic. Um, and I know that we did CBS. Gail King, CBS and, Morning, and CBS Gail, Gail. And Gail also had a really strong reaction. And I had a really strong reaction. And I think that it is gonna resonate with so many people. First of all, so many women who tried to do anything. <laughs> Who's, you know, our generation, Gen X, and and even a little bit younger than, uh, than me. Um, because the rampant misogyny and being told again and again, being gaslit again and again and again by like, oh, that didn't really happen. That wasn't that bad. Oh, which I'm gonna get right now. Because the book comes out today. So I've got, I'm, I'm buckled in, I'm ready. Because they're gonna say, oh, it wasn't that bad. That didn't really happen. He wasn't that bad. She wasn't so horrible. So I'm ready. Lisa, I wanna tell you a story, maybe not on camera. Mm. Well, maybe I will. <laughs> Listen, I, I wanna tell you a story because I, in the end of the book, Lisa has, well, it's not exactly the end of the book, but in towards the end of the book, Lisa talks about people ask her all the time, how are you so brave? And how can I be brave as well? And she really, you really like lay it out in such a perfect way. That's the journalist in you. Um, of just like actionable steps to being brave and how we can all be a little bit braver in our lives in standing up for things. And I have always been a person, always, who if I see something, I say something, you know, like I'm like just one of those people. Um, and then I got into this industry that I wanted to be a part of and things were not great. And I was like, I had to smile and I had to take it. I had to nod and I had to do it, you know. But in the last several years, well, first of all, I've had a few emails myself of people reaching out and apologizing. But I had like, you know, retweeted some articles and a man that I knew who was a writer, who was sort of tangential, or not tangentially, he was involved in one of these things, sent me an email saying, this is all wrong. This is the 90s, this is specific to the Friends, the Friends case, the writer's room case. Mm -hmm. And I know what I would have done in the early 2000s. I would have been like, oh yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, you know what? I'll just take that tweet down. And instead I wrote back like, I understand that that was your perception of the events, but we don't get to hear the other side ever. You've gone on to do tons of TV shows and tell lots of stories. That woman's career ended. And not only that, it put a law in place in California, making harassment and like sexual innuendo in the workplace very messy for women to come forward with their own stories in the name of creative freedom. And I was like, it did a world of harm. I'm not saying you did that. I'm just saying you were a piece of it. And maybe you should just look at that. That's all. And I didn't hear that. But I'm just saying, like, I think that there's a collective shift in calling it out. I think there is. I hope so. And I think if more people call people out, it becomes easier for the next person. Um, so when you asked me about what I would like to see happen yes. with the next part of my life, the book, um, I think, is, is important to read for a lot of reasons, but what I would really like to see is I would like to see somebody do a scripted series based on this book and based on Honey, this. it's Reese Witherspoon, and I'm just going to tell you, I already thought of it. Or, actually, I was going to put you in touch with um, my friend from college. What, who Bertie works with? What, why am I blanking? Mark, Gloria. Gloria Calderon. Oh, you know Gloria? She's amazing. I went to college with Gloria Calderon at LMU when you met when you knew me. Um, 
And I was thinking as I was reading this book, like, first of all, I saw two versions of things. There's like a series where it's like a flashback of like little 80s you sticking out for your brother and trying, wanting to solve crimes. This is the cutest thing ever. You guys will die. But also like that you were always like sticking out for your family and your friends and doing the right thing. Like a flashback and then flash forward. An origin story. Yes, we like Guys, I'm just pitching it right now. Should we just continue? <laughs> yes. I think it should, I think it could be, I actually think it could be an amazing series. I think it could be a great movie too. I was thinking about that as I was reading it. I'm like, this is just the trajectory of of how it all comes to be is so fascinating. It's just very visual. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, my entire life has been on camera since I was 15. So it's like, it's like I see the scenes playing out, but until you visualize and manifest things, they don't happen unless you choose to say, this is what I want to happen. People are constantly saying, we're looking for Latina stories. We're looking for people of color. We're looking for the shadow water. We're looking for strong women driven, you know, uh, stories. Latina, women driven, fish out of water, blah, blah, blah. So there you go. I don't know. If it doesn't happen, it's not because I'm not trying to manifest it. I'm putting it out there. Well, I already knew that this was going to happen because I'm putting you in touch with Gloria. So you guys don't worry about it because we got it. <laughs> we got it under lock. And I don't even need to be any, I don't need any credit except for those of us in this room tonight will remember. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's you, you know what I mean? We'll just, we'll just, we'll, we will know. But like so many things, I don't need credit for everything, you know. I um, <laughs> I just I'm just joking. Um, that's what I want too. I really see it though as like a little kid in the '80s. I actually see I don't. I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna do it myself. Yeah, '70s. So '70s? No, it's like the early '80s, right? No, I'm 58. Honey, I don't know. You look. <laughs> I swear to God, at this point, if someone tells me anywhere between the ages of like 29 and 65, I'm like, okay, we all look alike. Yeah, everybody's like, it's like everyone's aging the same. I don't fucking know. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, yes, we're we're wrapping it up. We're wrapping it up. But um, I really see that for you. I really see great things for this book. But most of all, like, I know how unbelievably and you will read how unbelievably painful the time during and after Monday night football was for you and how you did nothing nothing to deserve the abuse that you endured and I want to say no matter what any fucking sports asshole says in the next week month, year, lifetime, I know your experience was real. I know that that happened to you. And you're not going to let them gaslight you again. And I'm so proud of you. Thank you. I'm proud of you. Thank you so much for being here with you. You are such a warrior. Such a everybody. You're going to love this book. It's so good. Thank you.